Hello everybody, it's Dr. Rick dropping in on you. Hope everybody is off to a good start uh, in whatever you, whatever it is you are attempting to get done this week. I wish you the best. Uh, this is the first segment of this week for the Black Voice channel. We're in the middle of making some adjustments and doing some things differently. So you will probably see a decrease in frequency and what we hope to be an increase in quality, in topic and content. Uh, I want to make sure that what I bring to you is on point. Uh, I want to make sure that it has value. I want to make sure that it encourages, it empowers, it instructs, it informs. And so I'm going to put a lot more into it. I am still going to come back and address the whole indictment thing. I'm still reviewing some of the uh, comments in that section and uh, a lot of what I expected. Uh, but when I come back, I'm going to come back and I'm going to present you with some receipts. Again, I'm not here to tell you what to think, but I am challenging you to think and think outside of the box of the narrative that's being presented to you. Also, something that I do. Um, as a researcher, as someone literally who has made a living uh, in the realm of research, is I attack my bias. Everybody has this thing called confirmation bias. You hold beliefs about things, and you tend to look for information that confirms the belief. And you'll hear people talk about all the time, I've done research. Well, if you went online and you look for stuff to confirm what you already believe, you found it because there's plenty of stuff out there. All you have to do is put in the right search words and you're going to get stuff that confirms it. One of the things that I actually do when I'm trying to uh, investigate or examine ideas or concepts, I normally try to prove myself wrong first. So I go out and I find all the information that challenges the belief I hold about a situation. Then after I have all of that information and I've actually reviewed it, now I go out and see what the uh, converse is, what, what, what's, what information actually supports my idea. And then I lay it side by side and I look at all the different variables from where did it come from, uh, how long it is, has it existed, and, and everything else that, that goes into it. But ultimately, one of the first things I do is I attack my own concept, no matter how strongly I hold it, because if I don't, I will tend to pursue information that supports it. So a lot of times what I'm seeing when people come on and they, they're they just regurgitating what they've been fed and they consistently do that. So again, that's on that note. I want to, uh, before I get into this, remind you that we are in the middle of a fundraiser. So show some love, show some support. Uh, if you believe in the work we do, do that. Show some love and support. And I'm going to leave that at that. Uh, at some point, we're going to have to get on board with that. We can't consistently go the, that route we're going and be so distant and disconnected from the responsibilities of community that we don't get behind the very things that can literally empower us and give us the thrust we need to move forward. But what I want to do right now is I want to first uh, pay tribute uh, to the people who lost their life in the Jacksonville Dollar General shooting, uh, Miss Angela Michelle Carr, age 52. She was the first person killed as he walked into the building. She was in her car. He shot into her car and killed her. Uh, A.J. Uh, LaGuerre, I hope I'm getting close to his name, A.J. LaGuerre Jr., age 19, was the second person shot upon the suspect entering into the store. Uh, most people ran out of the back of the store. The suspect pursued and shot but missed, returned back into the store, at which time Gerald Gallion, uh, age 29 and the father of a four-year-old daughter, came in with his girlfriend and was gunned down. He shot again at some other people and missed. Um, uh, shortly thereafter, police entered into the store and heard a gunshot, which they believe was the shooter taking his own life. That's the fast cap of what we're talking about here. Now I want to back up and I want to kind of examine some of these things because I want to talk about them because it's not I, what I don't want to see. Yes, 
The people I mentioned, what we need to always keep in front of us as we examine this is those people lost their lives. Their families are devastated. Lives turned upside down. The people in that city, especially black people, but others as well, are trying to make sense of something that simply doesn't make sense. This is tragedy. This is trauma. This is anger. This is hatred. But I don't want anybody to lose sight of those people because at the core, it's about them, but it's also about us. And I'm going to explain why. Uh, now that I've named them, I will give you the name of the shooter, Ryan Christopher Palmeter, uh, age 21, um, uh, wrote a suicide letter. After he finished shooting, before he killed himself, he called his parents at home and told them to go in his room where they found the suicide letter and uh, something else. But um, he then killed himself. And so there are a couple of things that I want to touch on. Uh, it's being investigated as a hate crime. Uh, and it's obvious he targeted it because we know for a fact he ended up going to a nearby historically black university. Matter of fact, the first black university uh, in Florida. And he was recognized and seemed out of place. So security was called. And once security was called and approached him, he left immediately and made a beeline to um, Dollar General. Now, it's obvious that when you look at the research that I've been able to do shortly, just uncovering a little history on this guy, he definitely hates black people. And if you look at it, pretty much he hates anybody that's not white. But what I want to really do here is because I'm hearing the word racism pop up a lot. And I want to really, truly make sure we frame things properly. Um, racism and bigotry aren't the same thing. Racism is systematic. Racism is the use of power, policy, statute, and structure to give advantage to one group while holding other groups at bay and maybe oppressing and punishing one group more than others. Um, that's racism. It's systemic. It's in the uh, institutional fabric of almost everything you can see in this country, uh, from academia to the job market to politics uh, to finance and on down the line is systemic bigotry is a personal hatred based on whatever biases a person holds and you can say that you can see that in every race there are black bigots especially a black man over 65 is a good chance he can't stand white men um, and the diff the thing the thing is most bigotry when it explode when it, it when it explodes it explodes in a locale meaning that it is going to impact a small number of people rel relatively speaking and depending on how explosive it is will determine the devastation and the collateral damage uh while the system has definitely in many ways facilitated behaviors like this i want to make sure we understand that just the hatred alone does not qualify it as racism. It qualifies it as bigotry and hatred towards black people facilitated by racism in a number of different ways that we can't possibly get into now. But I promise you, if you look through this um, extensive library just on this one channel alone, you're going to find a lot of different information on it, as well as the organization site. One of the things that probably got me most was Kamala Harrison's statement, Kamala Harris's statement that we're in, we're experiencing an epidemic of hate. Where is she from? This is the same person in California that uh, held on to information that could have freed a black man uh, or at least gotten him a new trial and, until he was executed. This is the same person that did not want to see the legalization of marijuana because that would reduce the number of people coming into the system that could be used as free labor. Her words, not mine. This is the same person. So, and then we, we, that's just her and her situation. Where in the hell has she been? Epidemic of hatred because these three people got killed? Sadly, and as unfortunate as it is, 
This is just one more time. She did 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 not what happened in Buffalo, New York, at at the at the supermarket there, not register. Did what happened in Char Charleston with the Charleston Nine at church when the clown actually prayed with them before killing them, and we still in 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 this millennium. Uh, how far you want to go back? I can go back to what 1619, lynching, whippings, draggings. I'm from Texas where a man named James Bird was dragged on the back of a pickup truck until his body parts came off. This was in the 90s. What, 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 at what point did it start being an epidemic, Kamala? I mean, let's, let's talk about this. It's, it's like we we are supposed to be dumb, stupid, or have a very sharp memory, right? We're not supposed to remember that this stuff has been happening to us from day one. For a long time, it was sanctioned. For a long time, y'all were making postcards out of lynching us. Hello, everybody. Dr. Rick here. Look, I'm going to get you back to the current presentation very briefly, but I just want to take a little time to talk to you about something that I've been working on for a while. You guys know I wrote uh, my 25th book, which was The War on Black Wealth. Uh, we're actually about to drop the release, uh, the revised version on that. You know, from that came the Legacy Wealth Academy's first full length 18 month course. This is A to Z to generational wealth. Uh, every mechanism, every practice from using trust to compound growth to asset allocation, diversification, asymmetric risk reward, and everything else in between that the major players are using that are available to you. And you can start with little as a dollar in building. This is a long-term uh, opportunity to build wealth. Also, there is my seven day online business lunch course. This is literally the blueprint that I've used for the last almost 14 years to build online streams of revenue. And I'm teaching you how to do it yourself and do it repetitively so you can build multiple streams of income. The information is going to be in the description box towards the bottom under wealth building. Don't miss the opportunity to take control of your life. We talk over and over again about wealth disparities. We talk over and over again about lack of power. It starts with us taking responsibility and control of our lives. On that note, I'm going to get you back to this presentation. But once again, thank you for supporting the Black Voice. Thank you for supporting the Odyssey Project. But most importantly, it's time to take control of your own personal finances. Have an unbelievable day. Now, let's get you back to this current presentation. And please don't get me started on. Because uh, somebody's going to show up on here and in, in, in her defense and talk about her being black. Uh, she wasn't black until she got ready to run for vice president because when she was sworn in as senator, she was sworn in as the first Indian American senator, not African American. Uh, not saying that her father uh, isn't black. He's of Jamaican uh, and Irish uh, descendancy. Her mom is from India. Um, and it's obvious what she claimed until she needed to claim or use blackness as a catapult or platform. I have very little respect for her personally because I've seen what she's done as a district attorney and as the attorney general in California. Um, but again, it's politics as usual. Everybody's playing their game on both sides. I, I don't care which side, Democrat, Republican, everybody's going to play this now. Everybody's going to play their political side. That's going to be the lobbying for uh, stricter gun laws. They're going to be lobbying for uh, more uh, availability of weapons because we need to defend ourselves. It's going to be all kind of play on this. It's going to be all kind of uh, playing with the emotions of people. And one of the things that happens with us is because we don't understand the depth of what's going on. We tend to fall into the emotional pull of the vacuum and we jump on little uh, tend uh, little, little, little trends uh, that are going at the time until they run out of steam and then we're left with nothing and we kind of just crawl back into the status quo and we haven't really done anything. Remember a few weeks ago when everybody was on 10 because of the riverboat uh, brawl and I came on, go back and check. I came on twice and I told you, I said, I'm glad to see that 
we as a people responding to the need or the defense of another black person, especially a black brother doing his job and getting jumped. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm absolutely proud that we responded, but I said we have way more to do. This is only a surface situation and we've got to be real careful. A couple of things I warned about. Number one is we need to be more organized in building because this one physical confrontation is just that. And I warned where we win in that Keep in mind that they carry guns and they aren't afraid to use them and they tend to uh, defer to gun use whenever it seems to be any type of escalation. They are a, just inherently afraid of us and they believe that we have the capacity, capacity in our physicality alone to destroy them. Genetically, we can get off into this discussion, ma'am. Uh, my ancestor, Dr. Francis Chris Wilson, almost rose up in me, but we're not going there right now. Uh, we're not. We, we're definitely not going there. We're talking about right now what's going on. Okay, so I told you several weeks ago. Yeah, that's good. I think uh, a couple of other people who have voices came on and said we shouldn't be celebrating that because uh, they play heavy-handed and when they come back they normally come back and something happens i don't know that this was necessarily triggered by what happened in alabama because it ties in with so many other uh things uh that has happened that was an axe day in, in florida that i didn't know about that happened 60 it was, it happened a while ago um yeah some of the anniversaries it was um the axe handle Saturday went over 200 white riders wielding baseball bats and axe handles threatened and beat black people in Jacksonville, according to Zen Education Project. Uh, it also coincided with the commemoration of the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington, the iconic civil rights movement. Um, um, something else. Oh, the, the, the Madden video shooting. Uh, all these things happen roughly around this time at some other point uh, in history. And it could have been that that triggered. They, they are really triggered by dates. And it could have been, you know, his way of responding to uh, how much press and hype the riverboat brawl got or more than likely this guy has been Baker acted. And, and for those of you who don't know what a Baker act is, a Baker act is... Uh, a situation in Florida. They got different names everywhere, but Baker Acted uh, in Florida means that someone has displayed such volatility and emotional and mental stability that they can legally be withheld against their will for 72 hour psychological evaluation. Uh, based on federal law, once a person has been Baker Acted, they cannot legally obtain the firearm. Uh, and so if this is true that the kid, he was because there's there's a report saying that he purchased the firearms legally well only if he hadn't been baker acted now they're saying without without, without doubt at some point he was baker acted now what they're trying to verify is was it a full baker act and was the baker act if properly recorded Meaning that was it literally in the books as a Baker Act and recorded wherever it needs to be recorded in Florida. But what we know is there is obviously some mental instability for that to happen uh, because you just can't come out and say somebody's kind of acting erratic and Baker Act them. There's got to be something severe enough for them to because anytime you take someone's freedom away, you're messing with their constitutional right to be free. And so you've got to have a significant reason for doing that. So when you Baker Act someone, trust me, they have done something that is definitely questionable and the authorities feel it's in the best interest of them and those around them that they be evaluated. Now I don't know what the evaluation turned up or turned you know produced. Uh, but other than that, he had no criminal background. Um, he purchased the guns roughly about six months ago. Um, again, I said, you know, he visit, visited the um, HBCU first. Uh, what, what, am I, what is it that I think? I think that we 
don't need to find ourselves being pulled emotionally. I think we need to pay respects and homage to the people who lost their lives as we've done in the past, but I think it's time for us to really come together and understand that we're never gonna have a place in this place because we were never meant to. We we were sort of pushed into by situations the release of our people. It wasn't because of morality that we were released. It was because if we did if they didn't do something, the union was going to split. And the South had the, the 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 better levers for rapid industrial growth. And so the North couldn't afford to lose the South. So this is what happened. This was about saving the Union, not freeing black people. It had to, it, it was a part of it. But what you have to understand in that, we became a people without a place. In that, we became a people that were feared in many ways because number one is you know when you do somebody dirt and all of a sudden you don't have the same leverage and same uh arm of power that you once had you start to worry about what if they get the upper hand then there's just this hatred there's an inherent hatred when you when you can cut someone's privates off stick them in their mouth and gut them and then hang them from a tree and then burn them alive there's some hate that that's some sickness there's a, a great deal of hatred and there is a level of psychopathy that i mean it's one thing to say i'm gonna kill you it's another thing to sit up and say i'm gonna attack you and there's a reason why certain areas are attacked there's a reason why it's done a certain way and what we have to realize now is the lynching isn't done in the same way, but the psychological impact of it is just as uh, nefarious. What you have to understand is lynching wasn't about reducing, reducing the number of blacks. Lynching was about creating terror. Lynching was about keeping black people in their place. And the behavior has been passed down in ways that even when it's not sanctioned, it's the go-to. I'm angry, I'm upset, I'm gonna kill black people. Because black, it's gotta be black people's fault that I'm disenfranchised. It's gotta be black people's fault that I don't feel like I belong in this place because I'm giving up something. It's, you know, and the thing is, it's like with anything else, we do it in our lives too, where we sit up and we blame other things, other situations, other people for things that are going on in our lives because the idea that we may have to be responsible for ourselves is a little more than we want to deal with. Well, it's being done on a collective level with a number of different whites. And it's amazing to me, uh, not anymore. I'm saying amazing because I'm trying to make a point, but it's not really amazing to me anymore because I've seen it so much that the, 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 the literal optics and the imagery is the same it's the same type of looking cat it's like you you almost recognize them on the street like hey a mass shooter, serial killer. It, it, it's a it's a look. It's that I never really fit in. Look, I'm awkward. Uh, I'm so the, my awkwardness keeps me at bay, and so now I feel pushed back and unaccepted, and I'm going to strike out, and I'm going to strike out at the thing that I blame the most, or the thing that is most accessible, and I think that. What another thing that blacks need to be aware of, and I think that we need to be making noise right now. And I don't mean in riots, I don't mean in uh, 
physical explosions. I mean, we need to be making noise economically, politically. We need to be making noise in how we move our money, where we spend our money, how we educate our children, how we act and carry ourselves with one another. We need to become more unified. We need to become more focused. We need to understand that we still have power, but we are going to have to come together in unity. What did J. Edgar Hoover say? He said that the greatest threat to national security was black unity. And you really have to understand the context of that statement. Historically uh, speaking, you have to understand that J. Edgar Hoover is saying this when we are in a Cold War with the Soviet Union, who is still, which is still at the time very much completely one big power block. We are looking at China trying to make noise. We're looking at the entire Middle East who can't stand our guts and would just love to blow up something over here. You're looking at Cuba, who had just recently uh, had missiles pointed at the U.S. on behalf of the Soviets. And so you got all these things, but what is Hoover concerned with? Black unity. The idea of blacks unifying scared the living hell out of him. He spent a great portion of his latter years as FBI director trying to disrupt the collective coming together of blacks. Uh, disrupted the Black Panther Party, disrupted uh, the Black Nationalist Party, moved and had sanctions going. It was J. Edgar Hoover, nobody's going to talk about it, that sanction hits on some of our civil rights leaders. We know for a fact that the U.S. government was definitely complicit and maybe directly responsible for the death of Martin Luther King. This isn't something just rolling off my lips. This is actually something that was found in a court of law. 1999, look up uh, King versus the U.S. And you'll find out the U.S. is found complicit uh, in the killing of Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, so this idea about this country being above board and, and everything you really need to start doing research and understanding the history of this and understanding where it comes from. Uh, you got to understand all of this happened under what, too? Nobody wants to talk about this, but it happened under what? The Johnson administration. Well, what was Johnson? He was a Democrat. Again, this isn't me praising the Republicans. They play a different type of BS. And you just have to know what type of BS you're dealing with to know what's coming. They are not going to protect us. They're not. Um, and the idea that we can expect them tells me that the job they it's their job to sell us a bill of goods. It's their job to get us to believe how many times I'm going to give you something right off the top because people love coming in saying, you know, th that doesn't make sense. And I can't believe this and regurgitating what you've heard from liberal media are uh, when conservatives get to going on their advantages from conservative media. Uh they're both pushing uh, angles and ideas based off of political uh, bantering. But the idea is this, that you are constantly fed an idea. And then you buy into it. And here's, a, here's, the, here's an idea that's been sold to you hook, line, and sinker, whether you're a Republican, whether you're a Democrat, it's been so, you've been so hook, line, and sinker, and it's, it's constantly thrown out, and nothing gets people in an uproar more that uh, right now, the people who are on Trump's side and the people who can't stand Trump and want to see Trump fall are all for the same thing, that believing whatever it is they believe is, if it, if it isn't addressed in the way they think it should, and I'm talking both sides, that it's going to destroy our democracy. And it's crazy to me, you know why? We don't have a democracy. We never had, this is a republic, it's not a democracy. You know what a democracy is? A democracy is where the people choose everything that happens. This is a republic, it always has been. When it was created, and the constitution was created, it was created based on a republic, to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all, to the republic, not to the democracy. The democracy would mean that everything that had to do with any type of changes, any type of statutes, any type of rules would be voted on by the entire um, um, voting class in the U.S. We literally hire people by way of voting for them. 
to make our decisions for us. And then we trust that when they get in there, that they're going to actually make the right decisions. Well, the problem is when they get in there, there are special interest groups. There's Big Pharma. That's the NRA. There's insurance companies. There's all these different entities that are worth billions and billions and billions of dollars annually pushing their agenda. And in most instances, these agendas don't align with your interests. Oh, man, you want to get somebody that gets hit heavy with this? The FDA. And you want to hold, know who doesn't hold the FDA anywhere close to as accountable as they should be? The people you put in Washington. So FDA, look at some of the stuff that's been approved by the FDA that we know for a fact now is not healthy for us. I'm not even getting on that most recent thing because that's the stuff that gets you knocked off and get your channel took. Now, I'm not talking about that, but I am. But I'm, I'm talking about foods that you can find on your shelf in any store right now that we know for a fact is absolutely unhealthy for you. For stuff that they will sit up and approve that there are alternatives and different ways to do it. We also got to look at how our food supply is actually being handled. And, and, and for those of you who are going to sit up and say, what does this have to do with what happened in Jacksonville? Absolutely everything. Because we don't have any uh, cohesiveness in thought, no cohesiveness in movement. What happened there could happen anywhere, and it can happen to any race. But how it's going to be responded to is dependent upon the force behind it. There's going to be a different response if that would have happened to white people. It would have definitely been a different response if it would have happened to white people and a black person's done it. We know this because we've seen it. And any other variable of a different situation, we know that there's a difference. The reason that it's different is because this world responds to power. Power is facilitated by wealth. And everything plays out then. And because we refuse to unite and come together, we don't have a whole lot to say. Now, we, why, I'm, here, here's the thing. Why do you think we got so lit about the riverboat brawl? Because that's the closest we've seen is power being able to fight back. And for the most part, I mean, a couple of people got caught up in that. Uh, I know Chairman got caught up. Uh, but I think that at the end, more of them ended up in courtrooms than, than us, uh, which is a rarity. And so those are the things we celebrated. And again, don't get me wrong. I'm not tearing down or talking down what happened. I, I, I believe that what happened needed to happen. I think that's what you have to do on a physical level. But understand, the battle we are facing and the battle we are waging isn't physical. What showed up in, 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 in Jacksonville was physical, but it's so much bigger than that. And so you've got to understand that they know our weaknesses. They know our flaws. They know our vulnerabilities. And even on a rudimentary level like this kid, I'm just going to show up exactly where they hang out and kill some. And, you know, fortunately, and I say fortunately because I can't think of another word, it's fortunate, I put it like this, it's fortunate that more than didn't die. From what I understand, he had a handgun and an AR-15, and um, only three people died, three too many. And with all the celebrating we did for the riverboat brawl, they lost none. We just lost three and never got to pass a lick. We lost nine in Charleston. I forget how many we lost in Buffalo. Don't Let's not get to talking about how many we lose at the hand of renegade cops. How many, let's not forget the guy several years ago that was walking around shooting people, stood right there in Walmart, walked up behind a grandfather with his grandson. And the guy never even saw what hit him. He just walked up behind him, pulled a gun and shot him. Went out to the parking lot, shot somebody else. Hey, everybody, Dr. Rick. One more time, don't forget to check inside that description box. Look down towards the bottom. You will see a label says wealth. Underneath that will be opportunities for you to gain access to our courses, our book, 
and the opportunity to learn how to use my blueprint for building online businesses. Don't miss this opportunity. Everybody needs to take responsibility and accountability for their financial situations. The outside forces moving against you are not going to let up. Those who are benefiting from your poverty, from your lack of financial mobility are not going to let up or provide you with a solution. It's your responsibility. I have done years and years of research. I've chronicled it in the book. I've laid out what I've learned over 10 years in this course, and I've learned from the best. This isn't me putting my ideas together. It's taking the best performers in this world in finance and saying, okay, what do they have in sync with one another and putting it in there? All of it's in there. You have an opportunity. Go to that space. Take advantage of it. Move on it. And let me know what you think for those who are signing up. We're getting a lot of great feedback, uh, but I want to know what you think about it. On that note, we're going to close out now on this uh, current presentation. But once again, thank you. That level of hatred is being pushed by different narratives um, where you're getting one narrative they're being fed another narrative through whatever media see we tend to go to the mediums that are going to give us the story that we think represents us or we think that gives us the best insight and uh, we can relate to well there are channels in in, in 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 media sources that are sitting up and talking about how America is being run over by blacks, how America is being run over by Arabs, how America is being run over, you name it. And it's to push uh, white anger, white hatred, uh, white intolerance. Uh, now, you got to understand this white hatred, this white anger, this white intolerance is being pushed underneath the covering of a white racial caste system. A system that without anger, without force, without any type of uh, emotional engagement is designed to benefit who? Whites. So now you move that underneath that covering and it becomes more dangerous. It, it becomes more emboldened. It becomes more like almost like a right. I have a right to go out and do this. I'm white. Now, that's not what's being said in the mind of people, but that's the idea that's being pushed when you're not careful and you're not aware of what's going on. Simultaneously, there's an inferiority uh, uh, narrative being pushed upon us. There is a poverty is your lot in life narrative being pushed on us. There is a you are naturally criminal minded uh, narrative being pushed on us. And none of those things are true. We are a part of our environment. We are a part of um, the experiences that we go through as children, as teens, as adults, we are constantly shaping how we see the world based on these experiences. And if we don't create our own capacity to change the experience, we will consistently produce behavior that's not conducive of empowerment. Now, we need to be prepared. We need to be armed. We need to be able to defend ourselves. If people are going to make it open season on blacks, then we need to be able to defend ourselves. This is not about becoming abstractly uh, hostile and violent towards anybody. This is about saying, if you are friends upon or encroach upon my freedoms, if you threaten my stability or my safety, I will respond in gist. I will retaliate. I will, to the best of my ability, defend myself. I have that God-given right. I have that right constitutionally, whether you like it or not. And that's something that we've got to do. We've got to stop thinking. And, and one of the things that I think that really bothered me uh, was one of the family members said that here I was. I thought racism was behind us. How many times I've been telling you don't fall for that post-racial America. Post-racial, it's a racial caste system. It's literally woven into the very fiber of America as an institution. It is in everything. Now, it's more difficult to be vocal because them Karens and them Toms are finding out that you say the wrong thing, you can end up losing your job. And I think 
that gives some people the impression that, you know, because you can get caught up or you can get pushed into a corner by doing something that is bigoted in nature, that racism is over. No, they need you to, to believe it is. So they need these people who are acting out like that to behave in a certain way because the bottom line isn't about how many times you get called the n-word it's about how many times you get turned down for a loan it's not how many times somebody wides by and you know spits at you or whatever that's some crazy stuff and you need to defend yourself if somebody spit at me i'm probably going to prison i'm telling you now there's nothing more disrespectful you can do to me than spit at me period so but same thing with, with that being said not being able to get business loans, not being able to get uh, renovation loans, not being able uh, to get into the same institutions that provide pathways to higher wages. All of these different things play into this big cavern, uh, that gulf that's between us and, and, and them and the power they hold. And so we have to see it in that way. We have to see beyond the physicality of the moment. We have to see beyond uh, what is being done on the surface and understand that underneath the, the, the surface is the current that's driving it. And it's institutional racism. It's um, the exploitation of us on a statute driven, policy driven uh, level that is really truly the one what's wreaking havoc yes every now and then you're going to have one of them that's going to lose it because something isn't going the way they think it should and they're going to act out like a three-year-old and it's going to ultimately likely end up in some some of us being harmed or killed and this is one of the reasons why we need to be able to defend ourselves we need to be able to stand up and sit up and say not on my watch and return fire and that has to be something that is a part of the equation. Defend yourself. But another way you defend yourself is by making yourself less vulnerable through the accumulation of power, through the accumulation of building. Um, keep your eyes open. We tend to be so trusting in our environments when we're out and we're moving around in a world that literally doesn't like us. We move around and we think we're safe and you look up and it's 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 gotten to the point where how did that first shot? We're talking about an AR-15. So you should have heard the first shot, even inside the store. That should have put your head on the swivel, if nothing else. What was that? And the moment he walked in, everybody should have been taking cover or getting somewhere. We also need to train. We need to train our kids. We need to train our women. We need to train our men how to use firearms, hand-to-hand -hand combat, but also um, hostile event survival. We need to know what to do when you hear a shot. Where do you move to? How do you move? Uh, the more you are practicing it, the more training you're doing in it, the less likely you are to freeze when it happens. Um, Again, uh, it's a sad situation, uh, and what's even sad is a lot of people are going to, a lot of politicians are going to use it uh, to push their own agendas for their um, super entities that are, you know, specific uh, interest groups that are looking for traction. And um, what I want us to do is sit up, first and foremost, send prayers and love to the families, do whatever we can to show love and support for the families. But really and truly ask ourselves, what are we doing ourselves to change the narrative? What are we doing to insulate ourselves from situations like this, not just physically, but financially, academically, in the business world, and socially in general? How are we sculpting um, and working together to unify, to build something. Uh, in the building of something 
it can't help but give you power and give you a sense of shelter and covering but you have to start building so on that note look i'm gonna get ready to get out of here um as i said in the beginning if you believe in the work we're doing uh not just on the black voice channel but at the isaac project in totality mm -hmm. Uh, we're asking that you show some love, show some support, look in the description box and give, uh, leave comments. Um, if you like what you're hearing, click the like button, share button. If you haven't subscribed already, please subscribe. Uh, we're going to put in some work. We're going to create more structure. Um, again, there has to be work done and I'm fighting and I've been fighting for years uh, those who are following me know that I'm not new and I've been doing this for a long time. And as long as there's breath in my body, I'm going to give myself to the things that most people don't want to do. The study, the research, the program development, uh, the program implementation, the things that require investment of time, energy, intellect uh, and resources. I'm going to consistently do that and I'm going to challenge you guys to support me, but I'm also going to challenge you guys to become involved. Uh, on that note, look, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. Uh, you guys, thanks for lending me your time and you guys have a great day. Uh, see you Wednesday. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They said I should give it up like yeah, that just ain't good. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse. Uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you.